or going to listen to you in the middle of the night in Australia. We listen to cricket in the middle of the night. <laughs> they listen to these uh, more important uh, uh, matters, which just shows the difference between Australian culture and British culture. <laughs> um, obviously, the fact that there are so many of you uh, here uh, this afternoon is largely because of the eminence uh, of our uh, debaters, um, uh, Dr. Williams, Professor Dawkins, uh, and uh, Sir Anthony Kenny, uh, not only um, one of Oxford's great philosophers, but perhaps even more important, a former master of Balliol. <laughs> um, uh, it is wonderful that... Uh, uh, both Dr. Williams and Professor Dawkins, who, of course, have been associated with the university as, as uh, teachers and scholars uh, over the years, have uh, come to Oxford uh, uh, this afternoon, have come to the Sheldonian for this debate, so we're tremendously grateful to you. Now, there are many charming things about this theatre. Uh, as some of you who don't know already will discover, they don't include the seating but if you think you're uncomfortable, you should try that throne up there, which is a complete nightmare. But one of the charms is, of course, um, the recently uh, renovated um, ceiling, uh, which shows, uh, uh, which has a depiction allegorically of the descent of truth on the arts and sciences, which is, of course, what we're going to experience uh, during the course of the next uh, um, uh, hour or more. So uh, without uh, any further remarks, I'd like to um, ask uh, Sir Anthony Kenny to uh, chair and, I'm sure, take part in the discussion. Thank you both. both for, thank you all very much. kind words. Um, I'd like to make a few housekeeping remarks uh, initially. Uh, the discussion uh, will last until 5.30, but it will end uh, quite promptly. Um, we are um, all agreed uh, that we would prefer there to be no applause, please, until, if you feel like it, at the very end. Um, a number of you have been kind enough to submit questions in advance. Uh, questions have been circulated to the three of us. Uh, and uh, what will happen is that if at a suitable point in the debate it appears to one or other of us that a question is particularly apposite, we will then read it from the cards which have been provided. Uh, I'm sure we all have cards in our own hands, but it's nice to have these trumps which have been uh, supplied. <coughs> uh, we are each going to make a brief introductory statement of our position, and then the discussion uh, will, we hope, flow freely. The topic is the nature of human beings and the question of their ultimate origins. And we're going to take this pretty substantial question uh, in four stages. First of all, the nature of individual human beings now, of all of us. Uh, secondly, the origin of the human species as a whole. Thirdly, the origin of life on Earth. And finally, the origin of the universe. I think that should keep us going, probably. <laughs> we will be, as it were, tracing our ancestry backwards. Um, neither of my <coughs> fellow symposiasts need any introduction from me, but I'd like very briefly to introduce myself and say why I am sitting between these two protagonists. Um, I'm... Uh, myself a philosopher, uh, and I'm an agnostic about the existence of God. I don't know 
whether there's a God or not. I'm open to persuasion either way. Uh, I'm flanked by two people who claim to know the answer to the question I don't know the answer to. So I sit here as a representative of ignorance. <laughs> uh, Archbishop, may I ask you to introduce yourself? As well as being Archbishop of Canterbury, um, I've, over my career, taught theology and some philosophy in universities, particularly in this university and in Cambridge. Um, I have a long-standing interest in the history of theology and the history of what we rather unhelpfully call spirituality, that is how Christians pray and understand their praying, and also a long-standing interest in the arts in general and literature and drama and poetry in particular. So some of that will probably creep into what I say later. Do I say any more at this stage about the, the subject matter? Uh, perhaps, yes, yes I think not. you would. Yes. Well, let me then, um, to kick things off, venture a sort of definition. Human beings, it seems, are the only bit of the universe we know about that talks about the universe. The only bit of the universe we know about that seeks to represent the universe and makes claims about truth-telling. And because of that, we as part of that universe are able to affect the ongoing life of the universe in certain ways, some of which we understand clearly and some of which we don't understand at all clearly. There is in our understanding and our knowing an element of what you might call feedback into the life of the universe. And I guess that one of the things we might want to talk about is what kind of difference it is that human beings make, the nature of the freedom we exercise, or independence, within that universal order. But within that, I would say human beings as language users have a particularly powerful central role, and that's a question to our understanding why and how do we use language the relation of language and consciousness in this making a difference to the environment we share. It's not a matter of absolute discontinuity with the animal world around us, far from it. But if we are looking for distinctives, this seems to be the area where we look. And just to conclude a very brief position placement, it does seem that we live in a universe which, while we would all have difficulties, I suspect, with calling it anthropocentric, is anthropogenic. It's the kind of universe that has produced conscious language-using subjects, that is, us. And part of what we're looking at today is exactly how we understand that, whether there is a question we can answer about the origins of such subjects in the universe. So I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Well, first I'd like to say what a privilege it is to be uh, discussing with Archbishop Williams. Um, I was very interested in, in the way you began, and um, it reminded me of two things which Julian Huxley said. Uh, one was evolution has become conscious of itself, and he meant in humanity. And the other is a poem that he wrote, uh, which I can't remember all of it, but um, it, it begins, the world of things entered your infant mind to populate that crystal cabinet. And I think that resonates with what you were saying, Archbishop, about the, the uniqueness, as far as we know, of humanity as being capable of, as I would put it, getting a model of the universe inside our heads. And I, no doubt we'll come back to this to this idea, I think it's extremely interesting. Um, I was singing to myself in the shower this morning and I, found, I realized that it was a, a hymn. I'm a, I'm a cultural <laughs> Anglican. Um, I'm not going to sing it now. I, I, will, I, will, just, um, say, I, I will just say it. Um, it it's, it's a hymn that we probably all know. Um, it is a thing most wonderful, almost too wonderful to be. 
I'm afraid the hymn goes off the rails rather after that point. That's very but <laughs> um, but um, I think that um, it is a thing most wonderful, almost too wonderful to be, that at least on this planet and possibly on billions of other planets, but certainly on this one, the laws of physics have conspired to make the collisions of atoms get together to produce nothing that any physicist would have dreamed of, but to produce things like us, to produce plants, trees, kangaroos, uh, insects, and us, to produce collections of matter, collections of atoms that don't just obey Newton's laws in a passive way, they don't obviously disobey them, but not in a passive way, but which move and jump and spring and hunt and flee and mate and think, at least in our case, um, which is a quite astonishing thing to have happened, and we know since 1859 how it happened. Uh, and it's almost too wonderful to believe, but we have to believe it because we now know it's true. It's almost too wonderful to, to believe that um, the laws of physics working through this very remarkable process that Darwin called natural selection has produced these gigantic collections of apparently purposeful beings which look overwhelmingly as though they had been designed. They carry a, a terrific illusion of design which fooled humanity until the middle of the 19th century. Um, now, I think that Darwin's achievement in doing that uh, was not only a magnificent achievement in itself, but it was a, a triumph of science which can be generalized to science generally because once Darwin had solved the problem of how you can get big, complicated, purposeful, and apparently designed things out of very simple beginnings, once Darwin had solved that problem, it then gives courage to the rest of science that the same thing can be done in general and that we shall end up understanding literally everything as springing from almost nothing or according to some modern physicists even literally nothing. And I think that that is a, a truly wonderful thought. When I say almost too wonderful to be, it's a thought that is extremely hard to comprehend and believe and many people have great difficulty in believing it and resort to uh, what in my view is, is an unsatisfactory uh, resolution to the problem, which is to say an intelligence did it. That seems to me to be an evasion of the, of the question, an evasion of the scientific responsibility to understand how things come about, how complicated things come about in terms of, of um, simple things. So I'll stop there for that. Thank you. <coughs> um, you began by agreeing quite a bit with each other, then tended, you particularly Richard, to some disagreement. Before I stoke that disagreement, uh, I'd like to make sure that we do agree on three very simple things. That is, <coughs> that the three of us all believe in truth, namely, that there is such a thing as objective truth, and it's not just an ideological construct to keep the lower classes down, or whatever <laughs> postmodernists say. Secondly, that we all believe in logic. That is, that we think that if two statements flatly contradict each other, they can't both be true. And thirdly, that we all believe in science, that we think it is one of the greatest of human achievements, and that we all owe the scientists of many generations a great debt of gratitude for the way in which they have improved the world. Is there any dissent to that or qualification? No. <laughs> Good. Now, can I um, suggest a, a line of disagreement or uh, ask for clarification of what you said? You said that um, the laws of physics were, of course, never disobeyed by atoms, and I'm sure that's true. You also said the laws of physics have created us. Now, it seems to me that there are two different things there. There's um, nobody is going to 
say that the laws of physics are being regularly broken. But that doesn't say that the laws of physics alone determine what happens. In a game of chess, nobody breaks the rules, but the rules of chess do not dictate the game. That, of course, is absolutely true, and uh, the equivalent of the, um, of the rules of chess would be um, natural selection, the process of random variation, random change in the genetic codes, uh, followed by non-random natural selection, and it's the non-random process of natural selection filtering the random input from mutation, uh, which ultimately creates uh, living things. So um, the laws of physics are being obeyed all the time at the, at the lowest level. And the complexity is the same sort of complexity as when you play chess, when a computer plays chess, um, when a computer does anything for that matter. I mean, the computers are only machines in which electrons are whizzing around obeying the laws of physics. But um, the, the, the layers of complexity on top of that, the layers of software complexity, um, produce the ability to play chess or do a spreadsheet or, 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 or whatever it is. And that, that's where one of my questions comes in. You spoke about how Darwinian selection offers a, a complete explanation of how we are here and why we're here. Darwin doesn't seem to me to have very much to say that helps with the problem of consciousness, which both philosophically and scientifically remains an enormous area, which I don't see very much advance in, in the scientific explanation of. And one of the things which makes me wary of simply saying we re have recourse to the laws of physics and that's it is the question of consciousness. What is it that grounds the, the first-person perspective which we are currently sharing yeah. in this discussion? I agree that that is deeply mysterious. Um, as a materialist, I suppose I'm committed to the view that consciousness is something that emerges from brains, within, within brains. Um, nobody understands how. And I regard that as one of the problems for the future. Uh, and uh, I think it will be solved eventually by a combination of neuroscience and computer science, probably. Um, what I would say is that if it, when one identifies a problem that science has, such, such as consciousness, and says, um, we don't yet understand X, and it happens to be consciousness in this case, um, then we should remain agnostic, as Sir Anthony has said, uh, what we shouldn't do is immediately jump to, I don't understand it, therefore it must have something to do with God. And, uh, and, so, yeah, and, yeah. and I'm not suggesting that yeah. we, we buy in God to get us a, right. a cheap get out of jail card on consciousness. <laughs> but what I am interested in is what it means to say that this is the kind of universe in which consciousness will happen given these, these coordinates. Because it seems to me that the question is not is there some point at which God interferes to say, let there be consciousness? The question is, does an entire universe, a system of physical law, which produces something not obviously physical, does that require some context of intelligence that is not simply the intelligence of one finite? I think that's the question we're going to be discussing in our fourth stage, right, the origin of the universe. I'll back so, off. So, <laughs> uh, without leaping straight to God, uh, can I ask about the soul? Uh, mm. Consciousness uh, is something we share with animals. Uh, a lot of the higher animals are, are, are conscious too. So uh, uh, if we're talking about something special to human mm -hmm. beings, I think it isn't consciousness. But uh, many people have thought that human beings have special souls, souls which are different from any animal, psychic organism, and souls which are immortal. Can I ask if you think that is correct? I'd want to go in between those two um, poles of consciousness as an obvious fact about animal life and something called the soul, and ask about self-consciousness, about the capacity of human beings to tell stories about themselves. We are beings who tell ourselves about ourselves, ask questions about ourselves, St. Augustine saying, I have become a question to myself as a definition of the life of human spirit. We tell jokes, we fantasize, we empathize, we even pray. Um, all of that is an activity of self-reflexive consciousness in a way which doesn't seem to, to fit at the, the animal level. And that seems to me to have something to do with the fact that 
some of us believe, we are capable of a relationship with that unconditional creative energy that we call God. And all of those things about our self-awareness, about our self-questioning, have their home in the context of material beings who are nonetheless capable of that sort of relation. So I'm, I'm wary of talking about a soul as if it were, as in the cartoons, you know, a rather ghostly form of the body that sort of flies away into the middle distance. And I'm happier with a tradition you'll be very familiar with, talking about the soul as the form of the body. This is, this is how this particular kind of material being has meaning, has communicative and self-communicative capacity. And is this capacity for self-consciousness the Aristotelian type of soul, is that created by God in each individual, or is it inherited from the individual's parents? I don't believe it's created directly by God, as if there is a, a list in heaven that God ticks off sending people down in, mm -hmm. in the strict succession. It's something which, as several of the early Christian theologians say, emerges in the material life of people subject by subject. It's to me very interesting that in the fourth century you have a theologian like Gregory of Nyssa saying some quite evolutionary sounding things and saying well the soul doesn't come in separate, the soul is what gathers all this together when the material processes of development are complete, it's not that extra thing which has to be injected Do you believe in a soul? Well, I, think, I think that um, consciousness that phrase gathering, gathering together is, is possibly quite insightful about what actually happens about, about consciousness in the development of, of, a, ba of a baby. And, and I think that it's quite, there's been quite good suggestions that a, that a baby is a sort of uh, mixture of a, an assortment of different semi-individuals who gradually fuse themselves together to become what we think of as our individuality, as our, as our conscious self. And I think there are some philosophers who feel that consciousness should be seen as a kind of illusion um, to, to bring together all the different aspects of our, of our mind. But I, I thought, Archbishop, you didn't really answer what Sir Anthony was asking because he, he wanted to know whether you believe the soul survives death. And, and, you didn't um, actually ask me that, but I'm quite happy to come to it. <laughs> I, I thought you did. did you? Uh, at, at the very beginning, but yeah, you're quite beginning. right, I didn't in the last moment, but please answer. <laughs> <laughs> The short answer is yes, the long answer would take quite a while, so bear with me a moment. <laughs> um, what it is that we develop in self-consciousness, in relationship to others and to God, is, for myself as a Christian, something which does not simply cease on material death. What it means that it doesn't cease, what it is for that relationship with God to advance, blossom, come home, I have no idea. I have a number of images, but no idea. And the confidence that I as a Christian have about that is not the belief that there's something in me that will survive. It's a belief in the kind of God who does not terminate the relationship initiated from God's side as I develop and grow. But could, could I just come back very briefly on, on, one, of, mm. on one of your phrases about um, consciousness as an illusion? Yes. I, I've come across this sort of language, and I have to say it baffles me rather. Yes. Because if consciousness is an illusion... What isn't? I mean, the, the concept of an illusion presupposes that there is yeah, that's, a you know, that's, that's correct fair enough, yes. that's way of that's fair perceiving. Enough, yeah. And I find that there's a lot of that slippage going on in some of the writing in this area. Um, consciousness is a mistake. But to talk about mistakes, we have to have a framework in which it makes sense to distinguish between mistake and a correct observation. Consciousness is an illusion, but we need, therefore, a distinction between illusion and correct perception, or even... I could go on, but you, you see the point. Yes. And to say that consciousness is something emerging to resolve the problems, if you like, of a discrete ETE perception is not quite the same as saying it's an illusion. Or to say yes, with Daniel right. Dennett that uh, there is no evidence for consciousness. I scratch yes. my head um, profoundly. <laughs> <laughs> I have a colleague who, who um, when one gets into this argument and, and they get, come to the point where one says, well, we don't actually have any evidence that any of the rest of us are caught. Maybe I'm the only one, only one who is, and so on. Um, and he, he finishes the conversation by saying, I'm not conscious. <laughs> <laughs> that, 
the thing that, Python, though, yeah, the, the, the thing that, that, that really baffles me about consciousness is that I can kind of see that uh, one could program a computer to behave exactly as though it were, were conscious, to pass the Turing test and actually fool people into thinking that it was conscious. But I still have trouble believing it actually would be. And yet I think I have to be committed to the view that it, that it, that it would be. Um, well, I think it's sad that, that you're have committed have to, to yeah. that view. Well, I think it's rather sad that you're committed to that view. <laughs> well, why? Computers are human tools. They, 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 they can't even add two and two together. They are uh, tools that are used by human beings, by human programmers. They can't even tell the time, and they wouldn't know what to do it if they but, did. But put, it, put it another way, if I may. Um, computers are... Oh, I'm a, Scientific illiterate here. Computers are binary systems, essentially, aren't they? That, that's what uh, they work at on. The, at bottom, bottom they are, yes, yes. but that may no. not be a very helpful way to no, put it. But mm. if, if they are fundamentally binary systems, does that mean that the, the way the human mind operates is invariably and always reducibly binary or are there other? Oh, no. Um, it's just, a, it's just a technical convenience that they're, that they're binary. I mean, what, what matters is the software which, it, which builds upon. The, the binary events that are going on at the base. But then the question is, isn't it, whether the binary-based system of a computer can, given its dependence on input, given its dependence on certain fixed processes, whether it could move towards a state that was not, like our, our minds, able to operate in a uh, non-binary... No, I think, I think it's a red herring with the, the binary... I mean, you could, you could have a quaternary computer or, a, or an octal computer. I mean, it, it's just accidental that it happens to be an engineering convenience mm. that computers are, are, are binary. Once you get into the realm of, of software, you can forget about there being binary. Mm. And, and Perhaps I could follow up Aaron's point by asking uh, whether you think a computer has free will and whether you think human beings have free will. Well, I think free will is a, is a difficult question, and I don't think computers have, have free will in the sense that I, that I do think that, that everything that happens in a computer is predetermined mm -hmm. by events in, mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the world, in, in, mm -hmm. mostly in, inside the computer itself. Um, so in that sense, computers don't have free will, but in that sense, we probably don't either. Uh, I'm interested to you say that because a lot of people misunderstood your first book, The Selfish Gene to say that you believed in gene determinism, that everything was determined for us by our genes and therefore we didn't have free will. In your second book, uh, <coughs> The uh, Extended Phenotype, you took great pains to explain that you were not a gene determinist. Yes. Well, usually not being a determinist includes believing in free will. No, no. Um, the, the emphasis should be on the word gene. Um, I'm not a genetic determinist in the sense that some people thought that I was saying that it's genes that make us what we are. Mm -hmm. um, whereas all, all I was saying is that it's genes that are the fundamental unit of natural selection, which is a very different matter. Um, you can be a determinist without being a genetic determinist. You can be a determinist who believes that, that events in the, in the world, events in the universe, come together to produce everything that happens afterwards, including us and including what mm -hmm. we do. Um, but that's very different. I mean, genetic determinism is a much more specific and, and less philosophical problem. Does it, does it mean that in principle every decision is predictable? Well, that, that's, what a, that's what a determinist that's what would, a say. would say. Yes. Is um, that what you say? Um, I, I, I hesitate a little bit because of quantum indeterminacy. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I. I I don't think that you can get away from determinism by postulating a, a ghost inside which, which takes decisions um, which are somehow independent of physical reality. Oh, I, I don't think that believing free will commits you to a ghost taking decisions independent of physical reality. But if, and I'd like to come back to this, if the distinction between absolutely inert stuff and mind is not quite where it's frequently been thought to lie, if the universe doesn't just break down into sort of ghostly stuff and hard stuff, then um, a decision is not something which some independent homunculus inside me makes, never mind what happens. It is something that emerges from a set of 
physical conditions not wholly determined, but innovating and thereby well, right, from making a difference. I mean, they, therefore not they could be wholly determined, um, but, but you would have the illusion of, 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 of freedom. I mean, there, there, are, there are... How would you tell the difference? Well, the there, are, there, are, there, are, there are neurological um, experiments where people have measured brain oh, states. Oh, yes, yes. I, I, um, well, I'll just finish because it, other people sorry. may not... Uh, oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, there, there are neuro neurological experiments in which um, uh, people make decisions like just reaching out for a glass. Or at some mm -hmm. moment, you have to reach out. Um, and they think that... that I, I think that I take the decision now. Um, but what the experimental results show is that actually the decision was taken some seconds before because you can tell from the brain states um, that it's going to happen. Well, uh, I'm not sure what that means, but I think it, it, it probably means, or might well mean, that um, when I think I'm, I've taken the decision, when the, when the illusory ghost in me, which I think of myself as, as me, takes the decision, it, it has already been taken. One, one of the things which makes that experiment, to my mind, a bit less than clinching is, of course, that it relates to fairly small-scale, short-term, rather uninteresting decisions. I would be interested, seriously interested, to find if you, could, if you could map that onto deciding who to marry, who to vote for, well, what we usually mean by decisions. Which is I suppose it's just rather difficult to do experiments on that kind of... Exactly. Um, yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and so, mm. per perforce, ju just as you know, geneticists have to work on peas because it's easier to work on... Than, I mean, I, I think you, you have to reduce the problem down to something that's experimentally tractable. But can we bring back to our commitment to logic? For yes. Us, if I can just press this one, because, again, it, it's an interesting conundrum to me. There's a, an old sort of chestnut of philosophical argument which effectively says, if you were to tell me that it is foreordained that I will pick up a glass of water in the next five seconds, I can actually refuse to do so. Now, my refusal may be predetermined, but you, you see that there's, there's a sort of yeah. regress of uh, mm. intelligibility. In other words, a true statement, I am determined, it is determined that I pick up this glass of water, is incommunicable. It can't be spoken without making a difference to my possibilities. I, I, that's, yes, I, mean, I think that's right, and that's the kind of thing philosophers like. <laughs> but, but can I also say that, that most philosophers don't like the naive picture of free will that that experiment presupposed? Right. I mean, it was an idea made popular initially by Descartes and by David Hume and a long tradition of empiricist and rationalist philosophers. Uh, that there was a, a sort of soul inside uh, that in, in which mental events occurred which were the causes of the bodily events. And it's that picture which that experiment presupposes. But since uh, at least the time of Wittgenstein, Frank Rowan and I both admire, uh, and Gilbert Ryle, who was my teacher here many years ago, uh, it's commonly thought that there are very sound philosophical reasons for denying that, uh, that that is the way things work. It's very much, it's surprising that you should admire it because it is very much the ghost in the machine picture. And you're saying, ah, the machine works before the ghost does. Whereas I think most philosophers nowadays would think the whole idea of constructing body mm -hmm. and mind like that is quite wrong. But why doesn't it destroy the idea of, 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 free, of free will? Uh, because uh, it only shows the order of events in an act that is undetermined may not be what you would have expected if you had the false philosophical idea. <laughs> well, I'm not so, a philosopher, and that'll be obvious. Um, uh, perhaps you should have invited a philosopher to... to <laughs> <laughs> uh, perhaps we should move from our uh, question one about human beings. Mm. But could I just round it off with uh, mm. taking up something that you mm. said, right? <clears throat> you said uh, when you were talking about possible immortality mm. uh, that as a Christian you thought this and mm. that. So do I take it that that means that you think the immortality of the soul or survival of any kind is a matter of faith 
and not something that can be proved by reason, as uh, many philosophers in the past thought it could. Broadly, that's right. And I, I can't think of any um, strictly philosophical arguments that would help here. And although it's interesting when people talk about near-death experiences and things that apparently suggest consciousness operating from a point of view outside the body, I don't think that settles a theological point. I, I would embed talking about my hopes for eternal life in the specific Christian discourse of revelation that I, that I accept. So I, I wouldn't be looking for a knockdown argument about, about immortality there. Yeah. Well, may we move on to stage two, the origin of the human species? Uh, and I'd like to start it off by reading one of the questions which was sent in um, by Dr. Robert Gilbert, mm -hmm. fellow and tutor in biochemistry, Magdalen College. And he says, do you think that human scientific knowledge can be wholly explained by biological evolution? Uh, would you like to start? I don't even understand what that means. I mean, um... <laughs> Presumably he means the existence of people like you uh, who have well, a lot of I mean, scientific if, knowledge. If, it, if, it said, if, he, if he said, do, do I think that humans can be wholly explained by, or the existence of humans yeah. can be so, I, I would say yes. Yeah. Um, but scientific knowledge, well, scientific knowledge is something that humans have in their brains. Um, so I suppose the answer is yes. I can't think what else you need to explain humans, or indeed any other animal, than biological evolution. Um, and I presume we all accept biological evolution. Yes. I'd, I'd guess that the question might be about some of what we've just been talking about, consciousness and so forth, the, the yes. capacity of uh, a materially based mental system to represent accurately or adequately in some, some sense the structure of the universe. Is that something which biological evolution in a strict sense can... can well, I, I think it's very plausible that, that um, biological evolution would indeed give rise to brains which are good at analysing things, mm -hmm. good at synthesising mm -hmm. things, and good at, at, um, at packing knowledge away. But it's undeniable that, humans, that the human brain does things which, were, which are far beyond what you would expect mm. of a creature that merely has to survive in the Pleistocene of Africa and hunt wildebeest and find water holes and, and things. So that there are strong emergent properties in the human mind which... Um, uh, arise presumably because in order to build a brain that is good at surviving in a certain way in a, in a mundane world it's rather hard to build that brain which is not automatically capable of doing more advanced things such as mathematics and philosophy um, in so, rather the same way as, as computers were originally designed hmm. as calculating machines hmm. and then without any modification it turned out that they're also very good at playing chess and, and drawing pictures and, and doing um, all, all the other things that, that, that they do. I, I find that very interesting because you're, you're suggesting there that the brain, in order to do the job in the evolutionary niche that it has to do, has to have a capacity in excess of the yeah. merely functional problem-solving yes. yes. niche-based. Yes. yes. Or, or if, if not has to, at least... A way of life was discovered by our species in, in which it did. Yeah. You know, other species do it, do it differently, of course. But, but, um, you asked if we all believed in biological evolution, and I take it we all do, that we might differ um, at the explanation of it uh, or the extent of it. And I'd like to put to you around the question whether you accept that uh, the first human beings had non-human ancestors. Yes, I do. And do you think that there was any divine intervention at the point when the first humans evolved from their non-human ancestors? Well, I think there's, from where I start, there has to be a point in the story at which the proto-human becomes conscious of what I'll call in shorthand a call from God or an address from God. Again, I'm, I'm wary of saying God somehow bends down and tinkers with the machinery, but that there is a point, if you like, implicit in the whole process from the beginning, a point at which it will be possible for that proto-human 
to be conscious in another way, including the consciousness of the divine. And that, I would say, is, is the beginning of what I would regard as humanity in the image of God. I, I have a problem with the very idea of the first human. Uh, I think there never was a first human, in fact. I mean, because it's all, it's all a gradual change. And um, I mean, would, perhaps I could no, no. ask Archbishop, I mean, do, do you think there was a moment when, as it were, the last Homo erectus parents looked down fondly at their baby, which was the first Homo sapiens? <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I suspect the Pope probably does think that because he actually thinks that God did intervene and, and well, inject a soul. I'll, I'll ask him sometime. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, think that, I think you're right that saying that there is a first human being, in a simple sense, is, is problematic on all sorts of levels. But the point at which I would want to begin to call such a being recognisably human, put it the other way around, if you like, is the point at which I would see that evidence of a self-awareness and God-awareness. Now, I, I haven't access to that. I don't know what, you know what was going on in the mind of the Homo erectus, Homo sapiens crossover period. But that's what I would have to say. Don't you think that that self-awareness, it might itself have been a gradual sort of in, emerging thing rather than a sudden... Um, I mean, you know, people do experiments on chimpanzees, which they call self-awareness experiments, where they put lipstick on the, on, the, on the cheek or something and see whether the chimpanzee, when it looks in a mirror, says, ah, oh, that must be me, and, and starts to... Well, that's one attempt that experimental psychologists have made to, uh, to investigate self-awareness. Um, I should have thought there is self-awareness way, way, way before you would even start to call it human. Hmm. I, uh, I don't. Sorry. I, I, mean, I was going to ask about this blurring between the two. Uh, does that mean that, that there is not a point when a new species emerges? I think so, yes. I mean, there, there may in some, in some special cases be a macro mutational step, where, and, uh, this happens in plants especially, where, mm -hmm. where a new species just suddenly comes into existence and is instantly. Um, incapable of, of interbreeding with the old, old one. But in, in animals, I think generally it's not the case that there is a sudden m moment when a new species comes into existence. So there's um, going to be happy interbreeding between not quite humans well, and let, let's just, say, just let's, humans. Su suppose we did a thought experiment in which we um, could go in a time machine back to in, anywhere we like in, in history, um, in evolutionary history, then um, you would only, you would gradually have a fading out of the ability to interbreed as you go further and further back. Mm -hmm. So if you had, if you did the thought experiment of hopping backwards in say um, 100,000 year steps in a time machine, and at each time you land and you take on board one passenger, and you cart that passenger back another 100,000 years, and then you see whether you can interbreed with the chaps that you meet um, <laughs> when, you, when, you, when, you, when, when you, when you get there, I'm suggesting that maybe 100,000 is too, too long, maybe 10,000 years, mm. um, that every 10,000 years stop, the most recent additions to the passenger list will always be capable of interbreeding with the next lot, and probably the next but one. But that there comes a point when the next but, but 10, for example, can't interbreed, and it, mm. it's a gradual fading out of ability to interbreed. And the interbreeding, by the way, of course, is the standard criterion for members, yes. members of the same species. Uh, you, you don't have any problem with language emerging by natural selection? Well, that's very interesting because um, I mean, language, true, true syntactic language, uh, as opposed to the many um, communication systems yes. that non-human yes, I mean, animals have. Mm -hmm. um, rec recursive, self-embedded um, uh, syntactic st structures. Um, that seems to be uniquely human, um, and by, I had always sorry, supposed Sorry, by recursive syntactic structures, you mean having words in it like if, not... That's right, okay. yes. Um, um, the, the adjective noun or the adjective noun, which yeah. adverbally verbed in the yeah. verb of the noun, the yeah. noun, and all that sort of... Um, which, which no other species can do. Um, now, there is some very interesting evidence that... Um, I think there are two or three genes, I've forgotten what they're called, uh, which have mutated 
so that they're different in, in us from chimpanzees. There are lots of other genes that are, but these particular ones are of great interest because when humans, mutated humans, mutant humans who have reverted back to the chimpanzee state can't talk. And so the suggestion is that what was required for language to evolve in, in humans was that at some point, this could have been a rather sudden moment when a particular mutation occurred um, which uh, enabled humans to, um, to use recursive sy syntax. And if that were true, it would be a, a remarkable example of a, a sort of major step in, in, I mean, there really could have been a, a moment when the child could talk and the parents couldn't. It's a problem who the child talked to, of course. But that we that, that to seems to me an enormously important <laughs> question, yes. who yes. the child talks yes. to, I because um, in, in ordinary physical evolution, there's no difficulty in thinking that a mutation can produce an animal with a longer leg than other members I of agree. the species. Yep. I yep. mean, you can measured the leg, but the idea that just one member had a language, given that language is a social community, I, think yes. I find very No, you can't really imagine that it would have had a language. It would have been, I mean, there, there have been other suggestions that the ability to do um, hierarchical um, embedment, if we can call it, started mm -hmm. before language and was used mm -hmm. in, in controlling. Um, uh, Presumably the child would just have shouted at its parents until they shouted back. Just as <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, if you, if, you, if you listen to those, those um, chimpanzees who have been taught uh, various versions of human language like, like sign language, um, c claims are made that they are doing it properly, but, it, but I think the consensus is probably that when Washo, the chimpanzee, says please give me a banana, what she's really saying is, me, 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 banana, banana, <laughs> banana, gimme, 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 yeah. um, which I think that the mutated humans can do too. Um, it's just that they, what, they, what they can't do is, th this is the house that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that Jack built. Mm -hmm. So it's actually rather like what you were saying about the brain, that the, there's a point at which um, there's a sort of step change in capacity which is not predictable simply in terms of the niche that it fits in. That's right, and it, and it could be an exception to my general prejudice that evolution is always gradual. It could be a, a rather unique exception. Thank you. So even if there wasn't a first human being, there was a first that, human it, That's talk. right, that's right. That, that, there indeed <laughs> yeah. could be, yeah. Thank you. Uh, before we leave the question of the origin of the human species, I'd like to read out one more question from the floor from Isabel Richards. Uh, it goes like this. Human beings are immensely imperfect, with so many of our potentialities unrealized. Are these failures of evolution, or are they failures of design? I imagine the first alternative is a question to you, and the second is... <laughs> well, um, there are numerous imperfections in not just the human body, but in, in um, many animal bodies. Um, and they are extremely revealing because they are, um, I mean, they, they, they won't surprise anybody on this platform, but, but to an American fundamentalist creationist, um, they're quite worrying because they're things that no designer could possibly have perpetrated. Um, I mean, things like the, the, the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which is one of the, there's a branch of the cranial nerve, and it, it goes to the larynx. But instead of going straight to the, to the larynx, it goes way, way down into the chest, and then loops around one of the main arteries in the chest, and then goes back up again, which in a giraffe is a detour of about 15 feet. Um, and um, so this, this has been um, often, often quoted as, a, as an example of imperfection. Um, no designer would ever dream of doing something as silly as that. But of course, if you understand it in terms of evolutionary history, it makes perfect sense because in our fish ancestors, the most direct route between the, uh, the, the start of the nerve and its end organ was indeed south of the um, artery that it, that, it st that it still is. And as evolution progressed, as the neck got longer, the fish don't have necks, as the, as the neck got longer in their descendants, the marginal cost of another millimeter of detour was less than the marginal cost of the immense embryological upheaval it would have taken to have jumped it over. The, um, so if you, if you look at it in terms of history, then it makes perfect sense, and we're full of examples like that. And rather serious ones sometimes, like um, the imperfections of our, the way we, so many people have back pain is because we're 
walking upright when, when our ancestors uh, walked on, on all fours. But I don't know if that's what the questioner means because she says that so many of our potentialities are unrealized. And I, I, that, obviously, nothing that I've said has anything, any bearing on that. I, I, uh, I think there are, there are two kinds yeah. of question going on here, at least. Um, imperfection and incompletion. Um, unrealized potentiality is about incompletion, isn't it? It's about the fact that there are things we might as individuals or even as a species conceivably do, but we can't or don't. Um, and I don't see that that's a matter of failure because in any system where we grow through time and develop through time, whether as individuals or as species, that's just part of what it is to be temporally conditioned, to live in time, one thing after another. Failure is, I think, another kind of question, isn't it? And it's yes. the, the apparent um, mm, what inefficiency or irrationality in the rather loose sense that you've just described mm. in terms of the But I almost wonder whether she means something like the Christian, I, I don't know, we're all imperfect because of original sin or something like that. I mean, that it is part of Christian theology, isn't it, that, 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 that humans are all born in sin and sinful until redeemed. And could she mean that? I think Isabel Richards is probably here. <laughs> Perhaps she could tell us what she means. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, well, I think that the context of the question when posed was when we think about unpotentiality, uh, I mean, potentialities that are unfulfilled, um, the context originally of the thought of this question was, you know, when a um, mother had a child and the child, for example, dies without being able to fulfill what could be its full life, um, and that, that there are these tragic moments in, in people's lives um, and you as humans want to try and explain or to try and come to terms with um, what those things mean and I think um, the question is based around do, do we need a so, sort of explanation for the fact that those things uh, are unfulfilled is that something that evolution will eventually for example get rid of? Is there some sort of no. end game? Or is there, or is, um, on the other hand, um, I, I think, no, is, it, is, I think you've designed. made clear the question, yeah. and I think it is much more a question to the Archbishop than to... It, well, my, my answer would just be, it's tough. <laughs> Stuff happens. <laughs> So, 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 um, so can we let the Archbishop answer, please? <laughs> I think I might feel obliged to say a little bit more than stuff happens. <laughs> yeah. um, because you're, you're asking, of course, the most fundamental question about, if you like, the, the emotional coherence almost of religious belief, how it's compatible with the fact that lives are cut short in terrible circumstances. I haven't got a mega theory that will sort this out. I have a kind of bottom line of understanding that in a world where change and chance are, from the point of view of any individual, uncontrollable, tragic accidents happen, um, that there is no way, or perhaps that's just an elegant version of stuff happens, <laughs> I hope it's not quite that, but that, that is one of the things that happens in a world where we are not in control of our circumstances. I mean, it it's, of course, inherent in the very idea of natural selection that, that distress happens. It, far, far from evolution getting rid of the problems that you're talking about, it's the very essence of natural selection that, that unfortunate things happen. Um, death, non-random death before reproduction, is what natural selection is all about, and it's tragic. And, and the, the, if, you, if, if one looks around the world and sees the sheer amount of suffering that there is in the animal kingdom as well as, the, as, as in, the, in, in the human, um, it, it, it is exactly as you would expect it to be if it were just the blind forces of, na of nature acting, if, if there were no um, overarching purpose in the, in the world. It's one of the strongest points one can make, and Darwin himself said it, uh, that I find it impossible to believe in um, something like, believe that the, the ichneumonidae, that's a family of wasps who torture their victims in horrible ways, um, could, be, could be created by a beneficent deity, some, something like, like that. Um, it's, it's utterly foreign to the scientific way of thinking to say, oh, 
isn't, isn't the world terrible? Shouldn't, shouldn't evolution do something about it? It's because it's terrible that evolution produces the results that it does. So this really is much more of a problem for you, isn't it? I and, think it is. And also, <laughs> and also the, the, the point that Richard made about, as it were, design faults. I mean, mm. our eyes having been put in backwards and that mm. kind of mm. thing. They make... It, but perhaps you don't believe that the universe was actually designed. All we've got to go on when we use a word like design is what it's like for us to design things. And that's a fairly short-term exercise with controllable material. I don't know, for obvious reasons, what it might be like to create a universe. I avoid the word design there. That there should be a universe which is intelligible, that it hangs together, that in various ways its processes converge to certain ends, Yes, that's part of what I mean by believing that God created the universe and that our God is an intelligent God. That, that involves God in what I'd call the micromanagement of the process so that there are, rap again, rapid excursions to adjust the mechanisms when they're not doing well. That I, I find very difficult because it runs straight into the worst, and morally the worst kind of case that you're talking about. If God can do that, why doesn't he do it more? Can we move now on to our third topic, the, the origin of life? Um, how did life originate on Earth? Uh, and it, it seems clear that life, the origin of life can't be simply explained in Darwinian terms because Darwinian explanation assumes true breeding populations. Yeah. So this seems to me rather more of a difficulty for you than it is for yes. the... Um, th th that's of course true. Um, natural selection explains an enormous amount once it gets started, but it can't start until you've got genetics. And so there has to be a kind of proto-genetics before there's, before there's life, meaning that there has to be self-replicating molecules is probably the best way to put it. And so the whole enterprise to understand the origin of life is an enterprise to imagine what it was like in the sea, probably in the sea anyway, in the, in the world, before there was life, when there were molecules bumbling around and self-replicating molecules that made copies of themselves uh, came into existence by sheer luck. Um, this is a, an event that only had to happen once, unlike all the subsequent things that happened in, in evolution, which where there's a repetition billions and billions of times of the same kinds of things going on. The origin of life would have been I'm not saying it was a unique event, but it, but it doesn't have to be any more than a, 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 a unique event. Um, once that happened, then the whole process took off. Nobody knows how it happened. Um, there have been various theories about it, and the currently most fashionable theory is the so-called RNA world theory, where the idea is that the original genetic molecule probably wasn't DNA. It almost certainly wasn't DNA. DNA is too complicated. Um, but it could have been RNA or, or something like RNA, which has the property of being a good catalyst, a good enzyme, as well as being a good replicator, and those are the two properties that you need. D DNA is a very good replicator, but a terrible catalyst, and protein is a good catalyst, but a terrible replicator. RNA is reasonably good at both, and so it's possible that it all started off with RNA, and then the twin functions diverged, and DNA, as it were, usurped <laughs> the replication function while, while um, protein usurped the, uh, the, the enzymatic function. That's the most fashionable theory now. Um, I would like to say a little bit more about, about how improbable it might have been. I said it required sheer luck. And um, there, there is an argument which I've put before that it could have been an absolutely stupendous stroke of luck. And this is quite an interesting argument. It, it, it uses the anthropic principle. Um, since we know that there are probably about 10 to the 22 planets, at least, in the universe, the number of opportunities for life to evolve staggers the imagination. It is conceivable that we are alone in the universe, and actually quite a lot of people think we are, and would, would want to believe we are. If we are alone in the universe, then it follows that the origin of life on this planet was a quite stupefyingly rare and improbable event. And that would be a very odd consequence because what it would mean 
is that when, we, when chemists look for a theory, like the RNA world theory, when they look for a theory, they're not looking for a plausible theory at all. They're looking for a highly implausible theory. Because if it were plausible that life could originate on a planet, then the universe would be crawling with life. And my view is that it probably is crawling with life, but, and therefore that it's not all that improbable. But by crawling with life, I might mean only a billion independent life forms have evolved. And a billion is such a tiny number compared to the number of planets that there are in the universe that these islands of, of, of life in the universe could be so spread out that they never have any chance of meeting each other or even knowing each other. A, a sort of celestial Polynesia um, <laughs> with, with, without any canoes to... to, to canoes. Yes, yes. Richard, in, in several of your books you've shown enormous ingenuity in proving that things which seem astronomically improbable are not astronomically improbable. But it seems to be a big step to move from saying that something was not astronomically impossible, so it actually happened. I mean, it's not astronomically impossible that the roof of the Sheldonian should fall on you in a moment's time. But I don't think that means it's going to happen. No. Um, but remember that it only has to happen once in the history of... In the history of... <laughs> And it only has to happen on one planet in the universe, and that, this is where the anthropic principle comes in. Could you explain it, to people what the yeah, anthropic if principle it, if, is? If it did, if it's such an improbable event that it happened in only one planet in the, in the universe, then th that planet has to be this planet, because here we are. And that's, that's the anthropic principle. When you, sorry, when yeah. you say had to be this planet, what kind of necessity are you talking about? I mean, philosophers distinguish between metaphysical necessity and epistemic necessity. Epistemic necessity is the opposite of epistemic possibility. Something is epistemic, epistemically possible if, for all we know, it might be true. But that doesn't mean uh, that, that something is epistemically necessary, therefore means that we know it is true. But that doesn't mean that it was necessary in advance. I think you somewhere give an example yourself um, of somebody who's put before a firing squad uh, of ten marksmen, um, and they all miss. And people say, well, there must be some explanation for that. And he said, oh, no. It had to be that way because I'm still here. Yes. Um, <laughs> and that's that the, doesn't seem to be a very good that's, argument. That's the example of John Leslie, isn't it? Yes, that's yes. Yes. Um, No, mm. the, the, the way I was using it, I, 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 don't, I don't know the words epistemic and, mm. and, and so on, so I'm not going to use that. But, but um, there are so many planets in, in the universe that we are allowed to postulate a theory of the origin of life which has only a very, very, very low probability of happening. And the reason we're allowed to do that is that we are here on a planet where it manifestly happened. Because we're here, we're thinking about it, we're talking about it. So if it's true, I don't believe for a moment it's true that there's life on only one planet in the universe. But if anybody here wants to say there's life, that this, this planet is unique, in, in, in having life, then they are entitled to do so because we know it happened here, we're sitting here talking about it. Therefore, if this planet had to be, with hindsight, it's not a necessity in advance, it's with hindsight, had to be the one where it, it, it did happen. I think John Leslie's ar ar argument is a little bit different. Um, I don't think that applies to, 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 to this. Can, I think we, we will be coming back to the anthropic principle when we're talking about the origin of the universe. Yes. But no, before just, we do that... Sorry, I'll just come, come back on, on one interesting question yeah. about the, um, what you call the protogenetics or the, the yes. pre-genetics. Um, is that as much as to say that even before we have a genetic scheme, we have the transfer of information? Yes. About it, yes. Rather crudely. And that... Um, if you like, turning back your own point about the origins of humanity, there's no point in the universal story where we can say there is no information being... I think... Um, 
that, one, that might be one of the places where you, where you would want to suggest that there, there was a, su a sudden moment when something happened. Um, information in this context would mean um, that there are self-replicating entities, but there is more than one kind of them. Um, uh, so it's not enough just to have a self-replicating entity which makes infinite numbers of copies of itself, because then you don't get competition, you don't get, get variety. Um, so it has to be something like DNA, probably nothing like as complex as DNA, but something like DNA where um, information means that there are, there's, there's heterogeneity in the, in the types of entity that there are. Um, and each type gives, gives rise to its own type with an occasional possibility of a mistake, which then increases the number of different types that there are, which therefore allows for the possibility of competition between them, where competition means very precisely competition to become more numerous in the population of such entities as, as um, compared with, with others. Um, and I think that that had to be the first step. Nobody knows, and it's a very, very difficult problem, how something like the triplet code of DNA uh, arose. It's, a, it's, um, it's um, often described as possibly a frozen accident, that, that once the triplet code had arisen, um, then it couldn't be changed, because any, any change would be completely, immediately disastrous, um, catastrophically disastrous. Um, but how the triptych code arose, I think, is a, is a, is a mystery waiting to be solved. But, I mean, ju just as um, I think I said at the beginning, we would have to say this is an anthropogenic universe in the sense that it's, you know, it's thrown up us. Is there then a sense in which we have to say that the universe is necessarily an information-generating system? The universe I think it's a very interesting point to suggest that the universe is an information generator. I mean, I, I wouldn't bring us into it. I mean, it throws up kangaroos as well. Yeah, sure. um, um, but um, yes, I, th I think it would be fair to say that, that natural selection generates information. I'm yes. pushing a bit further yes. back, though, which uh, I think oh, okay. Well, maybe that's the next time. Maybe it's the next We're well, <laughs> just about to, to move on to the origin of the universe, I think. Um, but uh, there's a bridging question here from um, Barry Billingsley. It says, surely if the truth is that the universe is billions of years old, and life evolved, it would have been better when the Bible was written to say nothing about how humans began. Did the writers essentially get it wrong? It's probably one for me. Yeah. <laughs> I can't imagine that the biblical writers were, if you like, faced with a set of options, including telling the truth that the universe is billions of years old and saying, oh, that's too difficult. The writers of the Bible, inspired as I believe they were, were nonetheless not inspired to do 21st century physics. They were inspired to pass on to their readers what God wanted them to know. Forgive the naked theology here, but I might as well come clean. <laughs> <laughs> and that means, reading the first book of the Bible, what I look for is the basic information, in a slightly different sense from what we were talking about just now, the universe depends on God and God's freedom. Humanity has a very distinctive role in that universe. And from the first measurable moment, humanity has made a rather conspicuous mess of that role. That's where the Bible begins. That's, that's what I need to know, so to speak. And I don't think that um, it makes very much sense to talk about the writers of Scripture getting it wrong in the sense that there was lots of information available and they happened to get on the wrong bits of it. But I, I wonder what, when you say humans got it wrong, I mean, presumably... Oh, original sin. Yes, quite. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I, I'm baffled by the way sophisticated theologians who know perfectly well Adam and Eve never existed still carry on talking about it as though it had some profound wisdom to impart to us. Um, in an allegorical sense, or, or I mean, that I presume is what you what you mean. Pretty much, it's again something which isn't just a 21st century invention, but some, it's a way people have read Genesis from very early on. But I don't understand why you really bother, because when you think back to who wrote Genesis, they were not. There's no reason to think that they possessed any particular wisdom or knowledge. Why would you want to waste your time 
reinterpreting Genesis to make sense of it in the 21st century, why not just stick to 21st century science? If I want to, un to answer 21st century scientific questions, then I stick to 21st century science. If I want to understand my moral and spiritual position in the universe, I reserve the right to go back to Genesis. Yes, but, but why, don't you then, why don't you then talk about moral and, and spiritual pro problems as you wish to talk about them? What, how does it help to go back to, the, to, the, to what somebody wrote in whatever it was, 800 BC? In, um... Well, presumably, Rowan thinks that in a certain sense they were written by God, not by these humans. I mean, and since, well, since, he, since he has been sporting enough to bring God into the discussion. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, you, I think, uh, Richard, believe you have a disproof of God's no, existence. No, I don't. I don't. That, you were wrong when you said that. I, I, I constructed in the God delusion a seven-point scale, um, yes. of which one was I'm, I, I, I know God exists, uh, seven was I know God doesn't exist, and I called myself a six. Well, why don't you call yourself an agnostic, then? I do. Um, <laughs> but, but, I, but I think it's a... I think it's you a are rather, described as the world's rather, most famous atheist. Well, not by me. <laughs> <laughs> not by me. Um, but can I ask you to, to oh, spell I'm a, out your I'm argument? I'm 6.9. Your, your Boeing... <laughs> <laughs> but you, you have your Boeing 747 argument yes. to show... I mean, I, I, be highly improbable I believe that when, when you talk about agnosticism, it's very important to make a distinction between I don't know whether X is true or, or, or not, therefore it's 50-50 likely or, or unlikely. And that's the kind of agnostic which, I, which, I don't, which I'm definitely not. Um, I think one can place estimates of probability on, on these mm -hmm. things, and I think the probability of, of any supernatural creator existing is very, very low. So let, let's say I'm a 6.9. Mm -hmm. Um, but that still doesn't mean that I'm, that I'm absolutely confident, um, that I absolutely know, because I don't. But I was uh, asking for your reasons for the high probability. Okay, the, the reason for the high probability are that um, complicated things, things that appear to be designed, don't just happen. They, as Darwin showed us, and this is what I meant right at the beginning when I said that, that D Darwin's achievement gives us confidence and the confidence that he, that he gives us is because he showed how you can go this wonderful thing, almost too wonderful to, to be true, this wonderful thing that you can go from extreme simplicity, where there is no design, where there is no complexity, and after four billion years, you end up with us. And that's an explicable process, it's an understandable process, we understand it, it works. Now that's a, an astonishing thing to have, to, have, to have happened. If you then go back and say, oh yes, but I expect there was a God at the beginning anyway, I mean, that, that, that completely undermines the whole rationale for doing it. Why bother to do it if you're going to, having devoted, having explained how it took four billion years to, de to develop complexity and the illusion of design. It's a betrayal of everything that science stands for to suddenly go back and say, Oh, yes, but there was a god at the beginning anyway who started it all off or something of that, of that sort. Consciousness is part of it. Intelligence, design, complexity, the elegance of, 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 of life, all these things come late in the universe. They come after a long period of billions of years of evolution. They've come, it took four billion years on this planet. We don't know how long it took on other planets, if there are. Um, but it's not something that just happens. That's the Boeing 747 mm -hmm. argument. But you, you, I thought your Boeing 747 argument was that complexity can only be produced by, uh, that a god could only produce uh, the whole evolutionary story if it was more complex than the whole evolutionary story. Well, I don't think it would have to be more complex, but it certainly couldn't be simple anyway. It would have to be, it would have to be I mean, if, if we're asking god to be capable of designing the laws of physics, min minimally designing the laws of physics, let's say, um, s setting the, twiddling the knobs to get the, the universe's fundamental constants right in order to produce a universe, perhaps um, dealing with the, um, the chemical events of the origin of life. Um, so he's got to be at least as compli complicated enough to do that, and he's got to forgive your sins and listen to your prayers and, and, or, and all that kind of thing. Don't, don't we That's have not to, a simple creature. Don't we have, don't we have to distinguish between uh, two senses of complexity? Yes. 
uh, and of simplicity. Uh, there is complexity of structure and complexity of function. Now, uh, traditionally, theologians have said that God was simple. That is to say, he had no structure. He was not spread out in space and time. But of course, in saying that he was omnipotent, they said that he had an enormous number of powers, an infinite number of powers. But there is a distinction between complexity of structure and complexity of function. Uh, take my electric razor. Uh, it is a much more complicated machine than a cutthroat razor. Uh, if the cutthroat razor is simple in structure, but it has more complex powers than the electric razor because the electric razor could only be used to shave a beard, whereas the cutthroat razor could be used to cut a throat. <laughs> Indeed, you needn't even have a cutthroat razor. You just find a stone, a flint, and... and, and um, I, I really don't see what you're, what you're saying. I mean, you cannot... You cannot just be serious. Just from two senses of simplicity. Can, can, I, can I have a go? Yes, yes please, please, yes. <laughs> Yes, you three are, you can do better. Not, not that I know much about razors. <laughs> but <laughs> but he, can't, he can't be a simple creature, he said. Well, in a sense, obviously not. We're not talking about a creature. We're not talking about a, a single structure or a single element within the system. We're talking about whatever it is that sustains the entire system. And I think what, what Tony was reminding us of is that long philosophical tradition, sorry to go back to philosophy again, which says God is simple in the sense that God is not the result of any process. It's not things that have to be put together. God is such that within that unconditioned actuality that is God, all sorts of things are possible in what he subsequently does, engages with. And that's the sense of simplicity, I think, that theologians and philosophers have been looking for. I, I was very struck by your discussion of complexity and simplicity in, in the God delusion and um, had to sit down and think a bit about why I didn't think it was, it was quite on the ball here. But I don't think the language of simplicity as just defined is, is nonsense. If you're talking about something which does not come to be, it's the sense in which you might say that the, what David Bohm calls the implicate order of the universe is simple. That is, it's not the result of a process. It is what it is, with all the complexity in it. It's not something that has been put together or brought to, into being. I have to say that I think the doctrine of divine simplicity uh, is in flat contradiction to most of the other attributes that theologians attribute to God, but I just want to put in a note of dissent. Yes, well, I agree <laughs> that. Um, what I can't understand is why you don't see the extraordinary beauty of the idea that we can explain the world, the universe, life. We can explain it from, well, physicists are now telling us, telling us starting from literally nothing. I mean, that is such a staggeringly elegant and beautiful thing. Why would you want to clutter up your worldview um, with something so messy as a god? Because the starting from nothing is so baffling. <laughs> interesting you say clutter, because I, I entirely agree about the elegance and beauty of what you're talking about. Um, I was, if I may say so, I was happy to quote you in a Christmas sermon a couple of years ago on, <laughs> on this subject, and because, if I may say so, you write wonderfully about exactly that elegance and that beauty, and it's a delight to read, and I find I'm, you know, inspired by that. I don't see clutter coming into it at all for the simple reason that, as I say, I'm not thinking of God as an extra that has to be shoehorned somehow into this. Which is exactly how I see it. I mean, uh, yes, well, that's <laughs> where we disagree, isn't it? <laughs> Could I just ask one final question before handing over to Professor Henry Book? Uh, you it should seem to be uh, attracted by the idea that there may be multiple universes, other many other universes, and this is at one point uh, something you offer as an explanation of the very uh, striking fact of the cosmological constants being so fine-tuned that uh, we are able to <coughs> live in <coughs> a universe governed by them. Now, it seems to me that intelligent design on the one hand 
and multiple universes on the other are exactly on a level. They are both metaphysical hypotheses because these other universes cannot be amenable to scientific investigation. Otherwise, they'd be our universe. And I'm not against metaphysics. I'm a metaphysician myself. But it does seem to me that if one ought not to teach intelligent or even mention intelligent design in science classes, one ought not to teach or even mention uh, multiverses. Well, there are no doubt physicists here who will, will, will give us the, the evidence. It's not just that multiverses are invented for the purpose of explaining why um, the physical constants appear to be finely tuned. There are other reasons for postulating uh, multiverses. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of uh, analogous situation. I mean, I, I can deal with the anthropic principle at a planetary level, and which is what we were talking about mm -hmm. before, where, where we said um, that there are so many billion pl planets, and therefore we can um, make inferences about the improbability that we are allowed to, 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 to um, entertain in talking about the origin of life. It's a parallel argument that's used with, with, the, with the multiverse, where the universe that we're in um, appears to be finely tuned according to some views. Not all views, by the way. Not all physicists accept that. Um, and therefore, in a rather analogous way to, the, to how, how I use planets, there are some physicists who postulate um, many universes in which... Um, each universe has its own versions of the physical laws and, and constants, and then by the anthropic principle again, um, we have to be in the kind of universe which is capable of giving rise to us, and therefore it's no surprise that, that, we, that we are. Um, that, that's only one way in which physicists mm -hmm. deal with that, with that uh, question. Um, there are other ways that other physicists do. I think we're about to have to wind up. I just ask you, Rowan, if you would like a final word before we ask Professor Brook to... Um. I'd love to talk more about the, the universe and multiverse question, but if I could just go back for a moment to the, the clutter question. <laughs> um, because I, I do think you put your finger on one of the things that does seriously divide us. For me, the, the elegance and the beauty you talk about is an elegance which is, if you like, simply framed by the sense of a god who is, if you like, <laughs> let's, let's call him the combination of love and mathematics for these purposes, <laughs> producing this sort of elegance, um, eternally, unconditionally. And I feel for that vision of the universe in the hand of God very much as you feel for what you've been talking about in terms of the elegance and beauty of the scientific explanation. That is, for me, at least as much worth contemplating, enjoying, not just investigating, but enjoying, as the scientific picture you've sketched. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I think Professor Book is going to say a few words to close the session. Chancellor, guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, as joint convener of Oxford Sophia Europa Group, I'm honoured to propose this brief vote of thanks to our distinguished speakers. They've surely met our highest expectations for serious dialogue on a subject that in the blog sphere so often attracts the angry and the opinionated. Charles Darwin declined to discuss humankind in his Origin of Species, declaring it a subject too riven with prejudice. In a culture that now contemplates the prospects for post-humanism and transhumanism, prejudices still abound. How, how refreshing then to witness an engagement of the quality we've experienced this afternoon. And how appropriate that it should have taken place in a university with which each speaker has been intimately associated and where the proper study of humanity requires the insights of many disciplines. As a historian of science, I might perhaps be permitted a moment's reflection on how high-profile events of this kind leave their mark. As with the debate between the Bishop of Oxford, Samuel Wilberforce, and Thomas Henry Huxley, such events produce delicious anecdotes and later mythologies that shape public opinion long afterwards. When a former Archbishop of York 
Dr. John Hapgood once engaged with Professor Dawkins. A newspaper headline the following day famously read, Apes have souls too, says primate. <laughs> <laughs> In, in such debates, there can be no easy victories. Of that contretemps between Wilberforce and Huxley, it was reported at the time that each had found a foe worthy of their steel and made their charges and countercharges very much to their own satisfaction and the delight of their respective friends. This afternoon, we've been privileged to hear three interlocutors even more worthy of their steel. Their contributions will surely have pleased their friends, but they've done far more than that in enriching our understanding and in probing those fissures between theism, atheism, and agnosticism, even if all three were voted 6.9. <laughs> we should thank all in the university who have planned this event and made its realization 